You know, much of your success as an online business, especially with guitars, will depend on your domain name. The owner of two great guitar domain names has contacted me and he has them for sale. Those two domain names are guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. Call or email them at the contact information listed on that page and they will give you 20% off the purchase price. In addition, they'll work with you to make payments if that's what you need. Again, that's guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. Hey guys, I got something really cool going on. This is a fantastic opportunity for actually you and I to meet and for you to hear some incredibly cool music. On Tuesday, October 1st, the Nashville guitar community is putting on a tremendous show of some of the top players. Pat Bergeson is going to be there. I had him on the show. He was mentored by Chet. Andy Wood, who's like lightning dangerous, also another guy that was on the show, plays mandolin, guitar, acoustic, he's a a wizard. Darren Favorite, who's also on this show, second or third generation Nashville player. Matthew Lee, he actually runs a Nashville guitar community, along with Paul Johnson and John Stazella, and he is such a tremendous player. Meg Williams, up-and-coming blues star, and Terrence Downing, solid player, rocking in Nashville as well. So it's only $15 to get into this event. Again, it's Tuesday night, October 1st. The doors open at 6 p.m. The show starts at 7. It's going to be at the Analog Room at the Hutton Hotel in Nashville. And I think that's on West End Avenue. Tons of gear giveaways from Wampler, Eminence Speakers, GuitarEFX.com, BTPA Cables, Lucky Dog Guitars, Groon Guitar Store, Morgan Amps, and Vaughn Scow. Pre-sale tickets. Go to the Nashville Community Group on Facebook and they'll have something for you there. And they also have videos of previous performers at this show on their YouTube channel. The other really cool thing is these guys have been kind enough to invite me to be the guest MC of the event, and I will certainly love to meet you if you listen to the show. Please come up, say hello. It's going to be a great night. Tons of cool guests, really good musicians. So come on down. Show starts at 7 at the Analog Room at the Nashville Hutton Hotel. All right, I will see you Tuesday night, October 1st. Be there. Aloha. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on the 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 Most Important Things to Consider When Hiring a Realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We got a great guitar player, one of my homeboys from New York City, of course, Joey Sykes. Um, I'll tell you about Joey in just a second. Quick, two quick announcements. Number one, thanks Walter Eno for connecting us. And number two, don't forget you can now watch the show on YouTube as well as listen to it on a podcast. And actually, three announcements. Jimmy Page, Carlos Santana, Jeff Beck, and Joe Walsh. I'd love to have you guys on my show. So if you're listening, please come on. Or if you know or a buddy of theirs, let them know and hook us up. All oh, right. Hold on. Hold on. Joe, 
Jimmy. <laughs> they're, they're, in, they're all in the bathroom. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if I want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Born and raised in New York City, currently living in L.A. Joey also spends time writing in Nashville. He's a prolific writer, actually. He's played over a thousand shows. He got his first real taste of the industry with the band Boys Town. They signed a deal in England with EMI, toured and recorded an album. His second break was a big one. He was lead guitarist and co-writer in the band Cal. In 1995, after only six months of playing around Manhattan, we managed to, they created a bidding war and ended up signing a record deal with Elektra and a publishing deal with Warner Chapel. When the Coward record came out in 96, they made a video, appeared on MTV and toured uh, primarily with label mates Third Eye Blind. And we're going to ask him, how the hell is he such a good salesman that after six months he created a bidding war? We'll find this out. <laughs> after Cower, Joey moved to California. He was playing lead guitar and was MD for Capitol recording artist Tommy Henriksen. The first single placed in the motion picture Blast from the Past. After working with Tommy, he played for another Capitol artist, Meredith Brooks, who sang I'm a Bitch. Was she a bitch? I mean, that She's song. She's so I, lovely. She's she so lovely. lovely. Yeah, man, that song was great, though. Uh, <laughs> The band, but you got to know, like, if she's in a relationship with someone, like, when they have an argument, you got to imagine the first thing that guy is going to say is, you are a bitch. Um, Damn right. Yeah, man. Band was <laughs> massive, and he got to fulfill one of his childhood dreams playing the Garden, Madison Square Garden Ooh. in New York City. He opened uh, for the Arrhythmics, and he also played the Staples Center, did a bunch of TV shows, Jay Leno, Rosie O'Donnell, who? Uh, Queen Latifah and Martin Short, and they toured around the U.S. and Europe. It was a really good gig. After that, he started writing. Well, he kept himself busy, actually. He'd always been writing, producing, and performing. He released classic new rock and joined another band that he started, which we'll talk about today, called Honey River. He's also been touring with the legendary rock group The Babies, which reformed in 2013. And they've since released a new, a new album titled I'll Have Some of That, which included the song I See You There, which Joey wrote. Uh, Joey's also written and co-written songs with close to 100 different songwriters, including a few people who have actually been guests on this show, including Bill DeLuigi. Oh, Bill. Bill's a great guy. Kelly Keegy, what a story he's got. Uh, Paul Taylor and Jeff Pilson, all four of those guys are on the show. And he's got TV nice. and film placements in loads of different spots. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, man. This is great. Thanks. Eight a little early. I know. <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning in L.A. I'm really uh, impressed here, man. Yeah, I'll be singing by the time the thing ends, you know? You know, I had someone come on one time. It was a guy in L.A., 8 a.m., and he says, uh, uh, Craig, do you mind if I uh, smoke a joint before? <laughs> I'm like, you're a lot, you know, whatever makes you happy, man, 8 o'clock. Old school. Yeah, really old school. Um, so your first deal with EMI, with Boys Town, was in England. What, what were you doing over there? Well, it, it, we were, you know, from New Jersey and, uh, you know, New York and New Jersey. And um, we just had, it, it's kind of a long story, but basically, do, do you ever hear of Boys Town in Nebraska? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's like a men, it's like a, a, like a, uh, a house. Kids home. Yeah, right. You know, way, uh, home for wayward kids. Yeah. I mean, it started out like in, I, I should know the year, but really, I mean, it, the, there was a movie for it that won an Academy Award. Yeah. And uh, anyway, there's a long history with that. So we had a manager who, who was the owner of uh, the China Club, which is a famous club in New York. Yeah. yeah, I know that club. And so our name Boys Town as a band was on the marquee. And one of the, one of the, the people who were working with Boys Town, like the New York representative, because they're all over the world, saw the name. And they, the, the guy actually came in to see what it was all about. Because if we were a band that was like, negative lyrics and all that stuff they probably would have shut it down because they have all kinds of copyrights so to make a long story short the guy met us and loved us loved the music and actually brought us to nebraska to play a show <laughs> and it was cool. the it was boys town and boys town it was on the it was on like the the uh, second page of usa today and it was just all this crazy stuff around boys town and the band and then, you know, we ended up, you know, through the China Club and all our connections getting a, 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 a little deal in England. So then we went over to England for a couple of months. Wow, that's wild, it was, man. It was cool. I was, yeah. that was like my first thing I did. So it was really cool for me. Yeah. You happen to know Larry Mitchell? I know who he is from New York. I don't know him. Well, his, you know? 
in his when I interviewed him, he has like all these China Club stories. He used to hang oh, out there all the man. time. Uh, I have a, a handful as well, but um, it's it was a crazy time because, like I said, I was so young and seeing. You know, I met George Harrison there. Wow. We did a, we did a private party for uh, Pat Riley. And Holy then. Crap. Pat Riley was a coach of the Knicks for everybody listening. Uh, Mick Jagger. Uh, you know, just everyone who was anyone was there. It was just like a, it was a cool place that you could go to and be like off the, you know, you wouldn't get bothered and stuff like that. So it was just a cool place. And, you know, so because my manager was the owner, you know, we would we would have little VIP with different people and, and meeting so Harrison cool. was like just crazy. Wow, that's a great experience. And how are you like in your young twenties then or something like that? Te- late late teens, yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's really and, good opportunity. And, and and it was it was one of those places where they would have a jam night. I think it was Monday night maybe. And and anyone at any time, Clapton would, would come up and, and play and, and and used to a lot. Like uh, just on an off night, no one knew, and he would just jump up with the band and and like play a couple of songs. That's the kind of place it was. That's pretty amazing, man. It was really wow. cool. Yeah, it was cool. All right, now give me the the sales secret. How the hell did Coward create such a strong demand <laughs> after only six months? And then what happened there? And, and then also in the end, what did you learn from that whole experience? Well, it was it was like mid nineties, ninety five, ninety six. Um, me and the singer Shep, Shep, um, you know, that's what he went by, Shep. Um, he used to come see me play, you know, in, in, in believe it or not, like a, a, a cover band that I was in. And he was like this, you know, kid in the audience. And, and so we ended up meeting and um, he had a really good manager when he was like 17. And, uh-huh. and you know, the, so I think the manager um, was instrumental in opening some doors and we had a big lawyer and, you know, but the music was re- the band was really really good. We were way ahead of our time for what we were doing. It was like um, kind of a cross between um, Cheap Trick and the Cars, you know. A- a- and it was um, we-, we were doing the whole thrift store New York dressing before like a lot of people were doing it. That's funny. Man. We just landed on on a perfect thing that was that should have been big. And um, again, to make a long story short, we had about three labels that wanted to sign us. And we ended up going with Electra, and Electra also had signed Third Eye Blind, which they didn't tell us because we probably wouldn't have signed if we knew there was going to be a band that was so similar, like in the audience. You know what I mean? Because yeah. labels don't don't uh, push two bands at once for this. You know, as soon as one band, like they they were kicking ass from day one with that semi charm life. You know, yeah. and so you know. So they signed both bands and we ended up going with them and it was a great time, but it was, you know, short lived because, you know, Third Eye Blind pretty much took over at that time for that label. But we toured with them and it was fun and it was, you know, again, got to do a lot of really cool things. But, um, you know, we knew that staying on that label wasn't going to be good and then uh, just kind of broke up after, you know, a record in the middle of making the second record. Yeah. God, that has to be pretty disheartening when you're going through it i mean as hard as it is to get a record deal let alone a major record deal and then to have that happen i mean there's there's a million stories like that with other bands like you get signed and you never the label never puts your record out because right. they don't think it's the right time and then you end up in jail you're in jail for like you know some people in their prime you know I mean, we were kids you know yeah to, to have that happen i mean on one hand it was great we did all the stuff that you that a young band will do and touring was amazing but to not get the full push yeah the major label it's almost like you're you know you're in jail but then you're let out for like you know visitation you know <laughs> oh, I told, it's almost like they crazy the only thing they did was buy you know they bought you so the competition didn't get you it's kind of like exactly. that exactly what they did oh, because man. if they if they really cared you're right they would do stuff like well you know we have a band that's very similar. You want to think about this, you know, give you a chance to think about it and tell our manager and tell our lawyer. And then that would have been the right thing to do. And if we, if we just wanted Electra just because we wanted Electra, we, it would have been on us, you know? Yeah, right, right. But um, wow. it sucks, really sucks. Well, okay, so 
as bittersweet as that was, what did you get out of that? Like, what did you learn from that experience? I learned everything. I, I, I never knew what it was like, uh, you know, to, to sign a major record deal. And all of a sudden we're in 30 rock, you know, with the pens, you know, with the champagne and the pens. And I'm like looking around like <laughs> so crazy, man. I, I don't even know if this is real. Like, you know, when sometimes you have a dream and you go like, whoa, it was so real, but man, no way. You know, that's really what it was like. And, and then along the way, you learn all the, you know, I would say the thing that I, I, I was able to take with me yeah. was when we were making the record, we, we, we made it in some of the biggest studios in the, in, in the world, in the United States. And the producer, Jerry Finn, just came off doing Green Day. And, and he was a really big rock, rock pop producer. So just to be able to make a record at like Bearsville, uh, Conway in LA, RPM and Sear Sound in New York, all the, wow. all the big ones. So just to be able to be a part of that and, and, and you know, see how a real record is done was mm. just like, a, you know, college in, in two months, That's you know. Really cool, man. You know, Jerry passed away early, a couple about maybe 10 years ago. But, oh, um, wow. Brain, yeah, brain aneurysm. He was a great guy, great producer. And uh, so, so that was a really special time making that record, for sure. Then you moved out to L.A. What, what prompted, I know you've, you've gone there a couple of times. Uh, what prompted you to do that, and what did you do for work once you got out there? The L.A. was, was, was I, I had been in L.A. with Boys Town. That, you know, a couple of years back and I loved it, loved California. And I was in my mind saying, man, I'm going to, I know I'm going to be in LA to live there or just spend time there. And it was such a crazy story. So we're shopping for clothes in LA it, with Coward, right? We're in a mall and this guy comes up to me and he goes, Sykes, I, I, I had to take a double take. And I said, I said, I don't do, you know, how's it going, man? And literally I, I'm face to face with one of my close friends from a long time ago. And I didn't recognize him was Tommy Hendrickson. Oh, cause, he cut, cause he cut his hair. <laughs> and I knew him from having long hair, you know? And, um, is he from New York? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, Tommy's from New York. So, so, Oh, he, his, his accent's worse than mine. Have you seen, have you really? heard him lately? No, no, no. <laughs> well, for your listeners, Tommy plays with Alice Cooper and Hollywood yeah. vampires. And he's, you know, one of my really close friends and one of the most talented guys I know. And, you know, <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so we reconnected because I didn't really know where he was, you know, it was 1996, you know? And so we reconnected. He was living in LA and, um, and that was like, another highlight of making the coward record is reconnecting with Tommy. Oh, that's cool. I love Tommy. And, um, so, uh, fast forward a couple of months, I, I left cow. Well, Tommy gets a record deal in that, in that time. He, he, he didn't, when I saw him at the mall, like it took about another eight months to a year and he signed with Capitol records. So we were in touch again and he, and he said, man, come out and do this with me. And, you know, play guitar and be my musical director. And I just jumped at it. I, I that's so yeah. cool. So you got to, not only is he working with, but he's a buddy of yours. That's really. Oh cool. yeah. And you know, if I had my, my way, you know, I'd play with Tommy and be happy. That'd be like my, you know, my, my perfect gig just cause of the hang, yeah. you know, and the musical connection that we have. And uh, so, you know, so that was a real highlight. So then that, so that was really the catalyst to, to bring me out for, you know, I just, I, when I left Coward and band broke up, I drove across the country, loaded up my hey. Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going, going to LA and play Tommy. Tommy's record is going to be big, you know. That's cool, man. That's so, uh, funny how I always, you know, I hear millions of stories like that. And it's always amazes me, like the serendipity of, you know, if you had gone right to the other clothing store, oh. your whole life would be different. And that just blows me away when I hear that. That's it. And, and then another little connection as it relates to one of your past guests is when I, when I did move out there, so Tommy used to live with Pilsen, uh -huh. Jeff Pilsen. Yeah. And then, so when Tommy got a record deal, he bought a house down the block. So where, where he was <laughs> staying with Pilsen, so then I just stayed with Pilsen. <laughs> so Jeff was kind enough. And, and Jeff's another great guy, man, really great talent. 
Yeah. And uh, okay. so it was like the three of us for a minute. We would go to the gym and spend all our time together on the hang, you know, because we really were down cool, the block. Man. Yeah, it was a nice little, really special time for me, you know. It's just uh, being in L.A. with Tommy and, and, and getting close to Jeff, you know, and just having a little music community. And, and uh, it, it was really nice, man. I miss it a lot. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, Jeff had a great story, you know, and then he got sober and everything. So he's he's done a great job yeah. in life, man. He's so he's so good. Yeah. Okay, so then you got with Meredith. How how did you get hooked up with Meredith and what was it like playing the garden, man? <laughs> so so Tommy's thing kind of, you know, ended, you know, another one of those situations which really was a travesty. I mean, his record was great. We had a killer band. I mean, the band was insane. Um, anyway, so somebody told me about Meredith because they were on the same label, Capital, and somebody told me about auditions, you know. So I was I was in LA and I said, yeah, might as well give it a try. So learned a bunch of songs. And uh, it was like one of those cattle call auditions, which really suck. They always suck. <laughs> I've been to a couple of them. Um, and uh, so, you know, I started getting, you know, making the making the cuts. I think what, what got Meredith was I used to sing, I, I sing a lot of background vocals. That's like my thing. I'm a sing lead too, but I mean, I sing really high background vocals. So I would sing all the female background vocals, on, you know, like live with her. And I was, and right. she was like, she's like, dude, you're a freak. So I was like, yeah, it's cool, man. It sounds good. So I think that's, you know, the, the vocal element, I think, because there was guitar players that were probably as good or better than me. But um, yeah, sure. I think the whole overall thing, whatever. But uh, and that was another one that was uh, got to do a really lot of cool things. And the, again, the band was was amazing. Um, the keyboard player, his name is Will Hollis. He's actually in the Eagles. <laughs> wow. And he's been in the Eagles for about 20, you know, 15, 20 years now. So, so it was him, Herman Matthews, who's an amazing drummer, played with uh, Richard Marks and Tower of Power and uh, uh, Kenny Loggins, just a killer, killer drummer. Um, Mark Meadows, a uh, bass player, another guy who's played with everybody. And, uh, you know, so it was just a, a really good band and, and uh, oh, in the garden, yeah, you were saying about yeah. that. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously on my bucket list, you know, I didn't really think it would ever happen, you know. When you literally you just go, yeah, one day we're going to play the garden. You don't really think it's going to happen. But <laughs> you, just, you just kind of like goof, goof about it, you know. And uh, there we were, man. Manager said, yeah, it's your lucky day, man. We're opening up for the Eurythmics at the garden and the Staples Center. And I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. That's so cool, man. Did so my all mother, your buddies come out or your family? or That was a good good amount. My mother was like front row center. and yeah, which That was, had to be really cool for her, man. I mean, you know, and, and Meredith was really cool. You know, she was like, man, this is your hometown. You know, play a solo or, you know, go up to the – because I never wanted to – you know, I'm always like, you know, respectful of the, the artist, the lead singer. So I would just kind of, you know, do just enough where it's not too much, you know what I mean? Sure. Unless the, the artist gives you free reign, you know? So she was like, yeah, man, go for it. So just, you know, stepping up to the front of the stage and like, you know, you just hit one note in the garden. It's like, you know, you're in another world, you know. That's so cool, man. That is really so, cool. Yeah, it was great. If, if you have any photos of that, uh, send them to me and I'll use that when I publish your interview. Of if, that. You see, if you see Annie, Annie Lennox, give her the, no, no. <laughs> they didn't allow photography or video. Oh, really? Oh yeah, it was pretty heavy. It's kind of oh, wow. Stuck. Yeah, that does stuck. suck. Yeah, yeah, that does suck. Sorry. Yeah. And it was before cell phones were really, you know, like selfie, you know. So it was just a whole moment that um, oh, someone bad. someone might have something, but I don't. Yeah. Anybody listening? Oh. You have photos of Joey? Send them in. Yeah, maybe they have some. Ca I don't know. They pay you that's, cash. That uh, sucks because maybe people think I'm lying. <laughs> no, I don't. It's not lying. You know what, man? I tell you what, um, <laughs> I, I've spoke, I've probably spoken to a half dozen guys who have gotten gigs because they had really good background vocals. And yeah. I mean, in fact, um, I don't know if you know in Nashville, Chris Rodriguez. 
I know the name. I don't. I don't know. He's yeah. actually another oh. New York City guy from the from the Bronx, actually. And uh, but he's gotten a lot of gigs because he's got very good high yeah vocals as well. It's so. Like it's a it's like a specialty, you know, to be able to sing in pitch. Yeah. To, to blend, you know, blending is is important because there's a lot of great, great singers that really don't sing great harmonies because they're too strong. You know, it's like you want to be able to fit in underneath the lead vocal and know when to you know go stronger and and pull back and and pitch is really important so there's a lot of little nuances that you know people don't factor in but it's a it's a pretty specialty thing i think i'm glad you got that man yeah you've done a lot of sync licensing for tv movies how'd you get into that besides being a good writer i gotta tell you that um i I, you know i listen to a lot of your stuff on youtube you're like I'm, I, as we were talking earlier, I'm not a pop guy, but I know I can recognize good pop music. You write, I mean, you write really good pop stuff, man. And oh, like I thank you. Few, it's like very consistent. And I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't even begin to know how to do stuff like that, but it, it's obviously it's a talent that you have in that niche. So, um, uh, you know, that's great job. How did you get, obviously that served you well in something like sync where you gotta have that popularity. How did you get into yeah. that? I just, you know, it was really around the coward years, you know, like 94, 95. Um, I I just, something kicked in. I just really got into songwriting. That's when I really started to get into the Beatles and stuff, you know, and Henley. And um, I I don't know. I just, I I think I just transitioned from being a a childhood, you know, stud guitar player. I kind of, you know, hit the brakes on, on, on progressing as a guitar player. I, I never got into that next level of just knowing the whole neck and every note and every scale, you know? Um, and then I just transitioned to really getting into songwriting. Then that's when I, you know, not long after that started going to Nashville, like religiously, you know, and that Nashville made me a better writer. I could honestly say lyrically, it made me a better lyric writer going there. Like I would, I used to go there maybe four times a year and uh, like 10 days at a time and just do like these marathon writing trips. And, and, you know, it, little by little you work with those lyric writers there and uh, you start to get better and you start to see how, how a song is really crafted and, you know, lyrically and no, no, no dead words, you know, no, no, not a lot of throwaway words, you know, every word, every really sentence, mean something to the song that you're writing and i just kind of kept that i kept that mentality through whatever pop or rock that i that i was doing or writing for other people and then um i really to this day man that's what i really really enjoy doing love writing writing yeah okay so so you became more economical as a writer i would say yeah yeah you know keep them keep them around three minutes you know pick a, you know, write, write about something that means something that, that the story can kind of go somewhere, you know, like in, within the song. I, I try not to write a lot of throwaway lyrics that are, that are just, you know, I don't know. A lot of people write like with the phonetics, like, like, cause not everyone's it's lyrics. Let's, let's call it what it is. You know I mean? People could give a shit what lyric is sometimes, you know, not, I mean, not me, but right. There are people who just don't, it doesn't hit them. Maybe because sometimes you can't hear what the singer's singing about because there's a certain stylistic thing that, that people lay down at, you know, whether it's a lot of reverb on the recording or just a certain style, you know, that I, I, I think I noticed a lot of kids, like 20 year olds, you know, that are singing. Um, a lot of times you don't really hear the lyrics don't come out because they have a certain stylistic thing that is different, you know, and that's, you know, it's just a choice, just a choice thing, you know, that being said, I, I had an interview one time with a guy named Cliff Goodwin. He was Joe Cocker, musical director in the late seventies. Mm. And he made a comment. He said, Craig, no, nobody wins a Grammy for the snare drum. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he said if it, it's all about the the melody and the Song, words. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so well, that, that's that's really, kind of what that, that's a little bit of what I thought as it related to guitar. I'm like, well, so I can lock myself in a room for 15 hours a day and 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 come close, probably not even come close to somebody like Eddie Van Halen or someone like that. Yeah. 
I, I could go that route, you know, and just, just repetition and scales and, you know, and still not probably get in his ballpark, but you know, that would be the style of player that I would be. And then what would happen if I didn't, if, if I didn't get my break as that, I would put all that time into that. And, and if I didn't get that break, then I would have been, you know, like you said, yeah, that skills not as transferable, but plus you, you, you like writing. Love it. You know, you yeah. love it. It's clearly your, your, you know, I could see just your energy about it. It's really high and sincere. So why would you do anything else anyway? You know, it's, you can have better results with you, stuff you're passionate about, as you know. Yeah. And the cool, the cool thing about writing, you know, even, you know, even today, I mean, I mean, these days I'm, I'm, I'm producing and, and mentoring and writing for this 12 year old kid. His name is Owen Rivera Babby. And he's, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a special kid, man. He's 12. He's got long blonde hair, killer, you know, looking total old school, but he's 12 and he's so into, I don't put it on him. Maybe his mm. parents or how he grew up, but you know, he's totally into all that stuff for real. That's so amazing. like for me to be able to write a song that he feels, cause I always make sure I check with him. I said, Owen, oh, you know what this lyric means, right? He says, yeah. And I love it, you know? So like, th that just shows you. I, I wouldn't really change any lyric for my own record. Let, and a 12 year old is fully understanding it. So when he gets into the studio, he sings these songs that we're doing and, and he understands it. And uh, that's amazing to me, you know? And, and it's also feels good, you know? That's cool, man. What's amazing yeah. to me is that you have the patience to work with a 12 year old. That's a special. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> I do have patience and, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's where it's at now. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's turning all my experiences and knowledge onto somebody like that, who, who, who wants to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't, I wouldn't have the patience for some bratty kid who's just entitled and, and, and like, you know, you know, not making me feel good about putting my time into that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, 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 I don't have that patience. Good. Let me ask you this. When you said you'd go to Nashville and work these marathon sessions, how, for someone listening who might want to do something like that, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, you know, how do you get involved in this? Because I bet there's people listening that would love to become better songwriters. Yeah, I mean, Nashville's tricky, especially now. You know, in the last five years, it's just blown up. You know, it's, it so, it's just so crowded now. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't even know how to give anyone – um, real advice as far as just going there. I, I, I would, it, there's no like NSAI was a company that was really cool. You know, if you could kind of get in with somebody, they kind of mentored young writers that are coming into town, but it's so busy now that I, I really don't know how it's done. I, I have my, my, my stable of writers that I, I just say, you know, I email a text, say I'm coming into town, you know, October 1st to the 10th let's put something in the books. Like, you know, it's like that, you know, so and then hang I, out with 10, whatever number of writers over that time and see what you can come up together. Yeah. I have a lot. Now that I've been going there a while, I have a, I have a stable of maybe 20 writers. I would say that I, I continuously write with, yeah. I've written with more than that, but I mean, continually like on my stable and between that, I put a little, you know, schedule together and yeah. then I have fr friends just to hang with and do, do things with. So I make it a little trip, but mo mostly when I go there, it's, 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 it's writing or meetings or going to see somebody, you know, but uh, sorry, I don't have advice, man. Cause it's not that kind of thing. No, I totally get it. And it is packed and crowded and all the guys I talk to there yeah. are out of there. You just drive around, you can see the place. It's, it's amazing what they're the doing. Good, the good thing about it is it's so, so it's so social. Like you could, you could literally just go there if you could afford to get there and have a hotel room. I mean, whatever, just go out any given night and, you know, meet people. Cause you if you meet somebody cool, they're not afraid to exchange numbers if, or, or, or these days just, you know, hit them up on Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. And you could, you could get, get a dialogue going. And if you, you know, if you're good, you know, you, you'll find your way. Uh, Joey, I think that's great advice because people are very supportive there and it's not oh, yeah. like just super cutthroat area. And if you hook up with someone and you say, Hey, we want to do some writing together and you get along. I think most people would be open to that. I will tell you, I will tell you the magic phrase. What's the magic phrase? If, well, if, if you go there and you're I'll an artist, you half. <laughs> that's a, 
that's a, a you you have to have that phrase <laughs> even more than half um no but if, if you're an artist like a you know you're you're really kind of like um promoting your career whether it's you're a singer or if you have a manager you know these days you know as you know the big writers um pretty much I would say almost exclusively write with, with artists, you know, to, you know, I, again, you, you can't just be a, um, an artist that nobody knows, like you have to have some stuff going on, you know, but, but then you could probably get with some writers that, uh, you know, if, if they see that you're kind of pushing your career and of course, if the, this is all predicated on, you have to be good or whatever good. Oh being. yeah, sure. You know what I mean? You have to have yeah. something that they think, uh, you know, but that's always a plus. If you're like really going for it as an artist, you could probably go there and, and, and eke your way into some sessions if, if the writers know that you're, you know, pushing your career. So. Well, too. And also things like, man, what do people look at today? How many followers do you have? How many, what, yeah. how many Facebook likes, all that kind of stuff. And that is just the reality of business today. That goes under the same headline as artists, like artists slash have yeah, art, <laughs> artist slash YouTube phenom. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so as an active songwriter, what are some of the things that wind up happening with some of these songs that you're working on, whether you write them yourself or co-writing? Um, you know, these, these. I keep saying these days. I apologize. It's just because <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> so, um, you know. Lately, <laughs> another word for these things. <laughs> See, that's a good, you're a good writer. <laughs> yeah. I think you, got it, a, you got a big lexicon to draw from. I'll be rhyming and shooting out puns any minute now. <laughs> um, no, it's just like, uh, you, you know, you, you write song, you produce it. You got to get it sounding like, you know, like a record that no one wants to hear a demo anymore. You know, you got to have it sound great. Um, you know, I think one of the ways you can make business is, is to have your stuff uh, pitched to TV and, and film. You know, that's one of the ways you can kind of make some couple of bucks here and there. Um, it's not that easy, but, it, you know, it's it's probably more doable than getting on, on somebody's, you know, album, even though no one makes albums anymore. That's part of the problem. You know, yeah. it's, it's single by single. So good luck being a co-writer on, you know, Keith Urban's next single. Good luck with that, <laughs> you know. So I would say that, um, you know, I would say going for, for sync, it's called, you know, um, which is uh, film and TV placements. Because you can have a little five-second clip on a TV show. You know, when you watch TV show, you hear music in the background. You don't even know, like, you know, sometimes you can't even hear it. <laughs> and it's there. Yeah. And, you know, if the paperwork is done right through your performance society you know you could you could maybe make a couple of bucks you know and and they all add up i mean i've had i've had some pretty good success where it just added up you know it's like 50 placements at over the years a couple of grand each you know then you know you could kind of adds up adds up adds up you know and i had a Got couple it. of a couple of film songs that were pretty cool um daddy day camp which was a, a movie with cuba gooding jr all right i remember that so I had a song in there and the other thing that's cool is like when you have a song in those things, you don't really know how much they're going to play. It's, it's, a, it's really a, literally a surprise. So I went to the theater to see it, not still not knowing how much I knew it was going to be in there, but still not knowing like, you know, how much of it's going to be. So all of a sudden I'm sitting in the theater and, and this, the section comes on and I hear the, the you know, the snare drums bah, bah, nah, and, the song started going on for like two minutes with no dialogue. It was like Cuba oh Gooding Jr. God. was doing this fast, fast, like, you know, fast film speed, helping these kids build go-karts. And there's my song, me singing, my version. It's called Human Being Human for two minutes. And it was just sick. <laughs> so that's like considered a really good placement. <laughs> Joey, when you... Do you get paid more the longer the song? Like, if yeah. You get paid, oh, you do. That's fine. Yeah. So that's like our. That was a yeah. rare thing. That was a. That was wow. a really good moment. Yeah. You know what's amazing? Have you ever? I don't watch a lot of TV, but I watched this series on Netflix recently called um, "I'm Having a Brain Fart." Now with the monkey and the kids. 
The Umbrella Society. Did you happen to oh, see Oh, I didn't see that, no. I was amazed because they had like <clears throat> top tier you know, songs throughout, and I couldn't believe how much money they must have spent. Yeah, well, that's, that goes to the budget of, the, of yeah. w- why certain TV shows, are, you know, when you hear about how much it is to make a show, that's a part of it, you know, is clearing those songs, you know. And, and honestly, like Netflix and HBO, those are the new record companies, yeah, you know, those are the new versions. If you could get like a little career, you know, with with some placements on there, I mean, that, that's that's where it's at now. That that's the new record company, and and that's why you'll see if you really dig deep, you know, people who have songs on those shows, they're not beginners. They're right. big writers, uh, yeah. you know, throughout the years. Even people who who have had giant hit songs that the whole world knows. They're 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 vying for those spots on Netflix and HBO. So, you that's know, that's where it's at. Man. Yeah. I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it, man. Yeah. Um, so like all right, let's go back to New York for a minute. Where in the city did you grow up? Uh, Long Island, actually. Whereabouts? A place called Elmont. Lacrosse. They were big on lacrosse, weren't they? They were, yeah. yeah. Good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I went up. I went to school upstate for a minute, and so there was a lot of kids from Long Island there. Wait, Oneonta? No, Binghamton. It's all the <laughs> same shit. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, I played all these upstate colleges when I was, you know, whatever, 16, 17. <laughs> and I remember the names. It's funny. I, I was out of my uh, league there. I remember it was because, like, I, I, you know, I'm, like, just from a blue-collar family in the Bronx, and I, I'd go up there, and there's all these kids from Long Island driving around, and they're brand new Camaros and they're like hey man were you in a gang I'm like I was like a fat short white dude I'm like no <laughs> if by gang you mean did I go to McDonald's a lot <laughs> yeah. yeah I was in a gang yeah I was like because uh, <laughs> no. they're just like oh you're from the Bronx and I was like well it wasn't easy but I wasn't like do I look like a gang member um funny. yeah it was funny w- what was growing up like what was your childhood like growing up oh man well for me it was like I guess a blessing and a curse because I started playing guitar when I was eight. Oh my so God. That's I really, you know, the, the blessing is that I always knew what I wanted to do, you know? Um, and, and the curse is that I was too pig headed to try anything else because I knew what I wanted to do. And that's I was just crazy, like, man. so yeah, my whole life has really been music and sports. Like my neighborhood, uh, every, everyone was all guys in my neighborhood and they were all older than me. And so we would play like, football baseball and then uh i I was really good at baseball i think and then uh like i I probably would have thought about that would be the only other thing if i would have gone a little bit further in baseball but then you know by the time i was graduating high school i had to make a choice and i was already in bands playing you know you know even touring a little bit so it was for me it was a no-brainer you know i just knew that you know let me graduate high school and then let me just pursue the music dream you know so that was it, man. Did you come from a musical family or cause that's really no. age? Really? No, no. I, I, ironically, my father kind of forced me when I was like a little kid to pick up a guitar, probably to kill time. And then looking yeah. back now, you yeah. know. Yeah, let's get some, you know, let's get this kid, you know, doing something instead of sitting around it. Not that I sat around the house, but um and the big irony is that now he wants to kill me. Because <laughs> of how <laughs> Because of how, you know, I've created a monster and now he's in California, you know. Well, that's and, good, though. That's uh, nice, yeah. Not to him, but <laughs> good to me. <laughs> um, what, were, what were some of the, the low points, maybe, that you had to go through in life and, and how'd you get through them? Ooh, man. Um, you know, low, one low point, I would say, is when I left California after Meredith Brooks. Um, I, I, after Meredith Brooks, I, I did one last thing before I went back. I auditioned for Don Henley, which was amazing, you know, just to be able to, I played like nine songs with Don Henley and his band and, and sang harmonies with him. And it was just, uh, for me, it was just so incredible to do that. I didn't yeah. get it. But so after that, it was just like, you know, I don't know, I guess there was a little bit of a lull, you know, in like 2001. So I went back to New York, you know. Because I knew New York was always a, you know, safe zone. You know, yeah. I knew I could always 
get a gig or, or just pick up and write with people or start a band or whatever I kind of wanted to do, you know? Sure. But, um, you know, I, I went back and a nine 11 happened. That's right. And it, was, it was just a negative kind of feeling, you know, it was a negative feeling. I didn't really have a gig. Um, I was writing a lot, which was cool. And I did some pretty cool things, but, um, it was about a four year lull of really just doing some stuff I didn't want to do. Just to, to make ends meet. Yeah. Musically. Yeah. When yeah. I say, you know, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was young. I needed money. <laughs> no, I get it. I totally, get it. <laughs> I was a man whore. No, I totally get it, man. Exactly. Like, that whole okay. escort thing. Yeah. I get it. That probably would have paid a lot more than music. <laughs> I call it the escort years. The escort years. And then, so what, first of all, thank you for sharing that. How did you, what broke that below? Um, or what changed or what was bottom that made you say, fuck it. Now I really got to make a change. Yeah. Just, uh, you work your way through it, man. You know, things, things got better. Nine 11, you know, you, we never forget, but you know, it's just, you know, it kind of leveled out a little bit, yeah. you know, had a couple of good placements and music stuff. And then, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. And, and then, uh, so then I, I met who is now my wife and moved to California. So that was like 2005, 2006. And that was a, that was a, this, the catalyst that just did it for good, obviously. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, in California from that time, that's when I was really going to Nashville a lot, which was great. You know, started to really build up my catalog, which is killer. Um, which is the way to be successful in sync business. You got to have a big catalog. Yeah. And that's when I got a lot of my placements when I kind of went back to California, linked up with somebody who kind of took my catalog and, and got some really cool placements out of it. And then, uh, uh, Babies came a little later on and Honey River came later on, but that's, you know. Good, man. Well, I'm yeah. glad things turned out. Good that you got married. Do you know Doug Bossy out there? I know. Uh, yeah, we, we've spoken on the phone and we were going to connect and we probably still will, but he's great. He's in, he's a buddy of mine. He's in Nashville. Oh, cool. Now. Yeah, he's in Nashville. Did great guy. Did he move? Very recently. Yeah, he's in Nashville now. So look him up when you go there if you need I didn't him. even know that. Yeah. yeah. This is like recent, like, um, I met him on the show here and then we just became buddies. We kept talking, but then nice guy, man, great guy. And then summer yeah. Nam, I was up in Nashville. So we finally got to connect and hang in person. So really cool dude. I figured you'd know him if you're into. Yeah. You know, yeah. Very successful in that. Yeah. If, if, if you had to go back or if you had the opportunity to give young Joey advice that would have made your life easier, whether business, personal, what, what advice would you have given yourself? Oh man. You know, that's the one thing I, I, I like my path, you know, like I don't have really many regrets. I mean, I, I, I busted my ass from day one, you know, I'm, I'm like really good work ethic. And uh, I think songwriting was the smart choice. Definitely. You know, I mean, I, I guess I could say, ah, you know what, I can't even say that. I don't know, man. I'm pretty pretty happy with with the path it's just everything doesn't always work out like clockwork you know especially in the music industry but mm. i i I've, i never had writer's block still don't have right i always feel like i could write a song i feel like i could be in a room with anybody as far as a player i mean you know just a couple of months ago i had a, a session where greg bissonette was a drummer oh and yeah I had he's amazing and like just for us to I never met him before we did the session and he was playing on some stuff and he killed it and we became friends and he was like, you know, heard my songs and was like, dude, you're a great songwriter and this is so cool and so, so grateful, you know, to meet you and play with you. So stuff like that is just, you know, it feels really good to, to, to be in a room and jamming with a guy like of that caliber and that history and just not feel out of place. Yeah. That you know, is. it's, it's like rewarding a little bit, you know? So, um, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know what I would change, honestly, you know, stuff that was out of my hands. Like obviously coward was a big turning point cause it was uh, my first, my first major record deal, but who, who would have known that, you know, you don't know. I've spoken to a uh, half dozen guys. Do you know, no, Greg Saran, he's in LA. No, he, he's playing with the B 52s, but he also, 
plays on Idol, American Idol, I think. Anyway, oh, okay, cool. he got sent to England with his band, pop band. They gave him a million dollars to make a record that, that what you said, they never put it out. Come I out, mean, yeah. I, I, it's just fucking amazing. I mean, so many of those stories, such a yeah. wasteful money. The business wasted so much money. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Even like when we, you know, on Electra, you know, you start to negotiate the money part of it, you know, and, and there's a separate thing. It's not like this anymore, but there's a separate thing called the video budget. And I remember even being young, I'm like, what do we need a video budget for? If, if they make a song a hit and they want to make a video, it's one day. They'll, fi they'll find $300,000 to make a video if you have a hit song. Right, right. We don't need to put that in. Let's, let's take that money and put it into promotion. Let's leave the video budget out, make them feel like they're getting something. Because if, like I said, if they want to make, they're not going to not make a video because you don't have a, a hit song. Budget. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Tons of sense. But, but that's just, you know, goes back to little lessons that you learn. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. That's my, did you happen to meet, do you happen to know Matt, Greg's brother? Never met Matt. Dude, he is no. a, one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet if you get the chance. He's a great guy. Just a super cool human being. Though. Yeah, I mean, they're such a nice family. I mean, yeah. you know, Greg, I met his sister. Um, just sweet people, man. And really, really high level of musicality. And uh, yeah, it was really cool meeting yeah. him, playing that's with him. That's good. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Dude, let's talk about guitars for a few minutes. Um, yeah. Tell me your go-to guitar and what others, what other two would round out your top three? I would say my go-to, which if you see pictures of me, I, and I'm sure everyone's sick of live pictures of me because I have the same guitar in all of them. And it's just because I love it. It's, it's uh, Tom Anderson. You know, I have a, I have a, and I'm endorsed right by Tom right Anderson. Next, right next to you? No, this is some old, this is a couch guitar. Oh, called, Okay. It's what called the e Echo, E-K-O. Oh, yeah, yeah. 1964. My friend from Argentina, his uh, father was a famous, uh, my friend's name is Facundo Monti, and uh, his cool father, Jaco Monti, is a famous guy from the 60s, and um, he had this guitar, and he didn't want to take it back to Argentina with him, so. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was saying, what are those big, it's like a Fender headstock, but these giant block Gibson inlays. I'm like, what the hell is that? It, it, it's a stock thing. It's got like F holes, you know? Yeah. I don't even know what it sounds like. It just resonates pretty good. It's like... Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Yeah. It's good, yeah. It's just like yeah. one of those things where I could, I could, it's a little slightly amplified so I could hear it and I just yeah. write on it mainly, you know? That's and cool. Learn songs. I'm in my, my living room right now. So, uh, yeah, it's just always kind of, it's right next to me. So you're endorsed by <laughs> Tom Anderson. Which, which one of his guitars you play? The Strat? I had one custom made. It was like a Tele body. It's, it's the blue one that's in all my live pictures mainly. And it's got P90s, yep. like the, the newer P90s. And it's just, it's a special guitar for me. I mean, I've had it a long time and I just really love it. It looks killer, sounds amazing. It uh, gives me the tone I need. And then when you lower the volume, it's, it's got a nice, you know, really nice thing, cleans up, you know, so I can get that kind of little, little clean break thing. And then, you know, it's just a great guitar. So I have two, I have two Tom Andersons, another Tele shape. Um, I actually have three Tom Andersons. One of them is acoustic. Um, you know, then I got, all the standards in the studio. I just don't play them live. I got Les Paul Strat, two Strats. Um, I got a 12 string. I have an old Gibson, uh, Chet Atkins. Gibson made a Chet Atkins for really uh, not that long. I don't, I don't be a couple of years, I think, because Gretsch is the one that everyone yeah. knows. Yeah, but it's Gibson made one. Um, I have an old Silvertone, which is really quirky. They used to be Tysco. Love those, man. Silver tones, oh, man. stratotones. I love those. All those guitars. Yeah, my friend plays guitar for Lucinda Williams, Stuart Mathis, and he has a bunch of Tyscos. And I was at his house in Nashville, and he turned me on to him. He's like, "Dude, if you can get one of these, they're around. You know, you can find them on on eBay or whatever." And 
I, I ended up getting one. I don't really buy guitars on eBay because I really need to play it. Yeah, you know? the same. But, yeah. But I figured I, I trusted him and he told me what to look for. He said, just get one of these and you could always, you know, kind of make it right. Um, and it's just it's in the studio, it's killer. And then my main, main studio guitar is a 64 Gretsch, a Jet Firebird. Oh, that's nice. With Filtertrons, yeah. And um, that's, the, that's on probably, I would say, 90% of my recordings ever, even if it's like two notes. Even if I just do something like color, you know, it just has to go on almost every recording because it's such a special guitar and really unique sounding. So Very cool. Yeah. I never heard, it's not too many times I hear a guy with a P90s and a telly, to be honest with you. That's unusual. It's, well, you know, with, with Tom Anderson, I was able to um, have a guitar built from scratch. So, you know, he's, he's good with kind of like, you know, whatever you want. Or, you know, what do you want your neck to be? What do you want the configuration? What pickups you want? You know, and, and they make it happen. And Tom Anderson, I don't, you know, makes amazing guitars, yeah. just craftsmanship-wise. So uh, I lo always love P90s. So had them put P90s in there, and it's uh, such a great guitar. Yeah. What was your first guitar? Do you remember that? Uh, Sokova was like a, I think a J Japanese guitar that uh, my father got for me when I was just starting. And I, I honestly, and this is horrible. It's got to be somewhere. It's probably in storage, like in new york that's what it's right. not with me so it's probably in storage like i have different storage units like my, my mother's and my cousins and sure it, it's got to be somewhere it better be somewhere because i know i never sold it I, I don't know i can't tell you where it is exactly but <laughs> i really hope it's somewhere let's put it that way do you remember the first uh i know i'm sorry i mean top desert island discs top three no particular top order and just three. for now okay um uh pink floyd wish you were here great record man yeah it, it, it i can't really say because it's a bunch of beatles ones so i would say revolver you know sergeant pepper revolver um but so many beatle ones that the later the later ones um hotel california yeah that's i think great. that i think that album is amazing it really is yeah just, just off the top of my head, yeah. Very cool. I remember when I got yeah. Hotel California, and I just couldn't believe, you know, usually, you know, it's like on a record, you have one, back in the day, you get one big hit, and maybe there's another, you know, another five or six minute song that's good, but there's so many records, so many songs on that album, which is great. And it was just like, I remember one after the other, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, and the writing is just, uh, you know, that that's something that I just, uh, it's crazy to me. Like, Henley is the, is, you know, rock, you know, America, you know, like country rock, I would say, but he's really got a, 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 a country mind when it comes to lyrics, you know, his lyrics are so clean. I mean, they, they're all great. Joe Walsh is great, you know, but Henley mainly lyrically is just a really smart writer and a special writer lyrically, you know, I, that always kind of got me. Totally. You know, waste, wasted time and stuff like that. It's just a, Crazy. Every, every even pretty maids all in a row. Everything there is just amazing. Yeah, great shit, dude. What's your uh, favorite New York City food that you miss? Living oh, pizza. You know, <laughs> got John, pizza. John's Pizza on Bleecker. <laughs> that was always uh, that was my favorite. Yeah, I miss the pizza. Dude, do you remember this place on Bleecker Street? It was called Pizza Box. It was on the other side of Sixth Avenue from John's. Same side of the street, but just across the other Sixth Avenue. They had like a, a you'd walk no. in, you could walk out back and sit outdoors, actually. No. That's my favorite. I don't remember that one. Yeah, they closed it down like seven or eight years ago. I was devastated. It's been around 40 years. What I love is like go, go, going into the city, like from Long Island, my friend was in a, 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 another band and we, we would play like the circuit, like in different bands. And we would finish like three in the morning and we would meet up. And three thirty, four o'clock, we'd go into the city. And yeah, have killer slices and salad, and just talk and 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 go look at the guitars in the windows. Mm -hmm. 
and we wouldn't get to bed, get home till seven o'clock in the morning. And that was life. That's, that was, that's the way it was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very and much so. Good very, memories, man. Yeah. Or you get, I used to get sometimes go to Chinatown also late at night. Yeah. Also open late. Whoa, whoa, hop. Whoa, hop. Whoa, on. That's right, man. That's so funny. <laughs> uh, man, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Um, uh, well, everything seems to relate to music. So I would say just reliability, you know, being, especially I find I shouldn't, I should bash California. I love California, but if I say I'm going to do something or be somewhere at a certain time or have a song together or, or send a song or whatever, write a song, it's pretty much going to be done, you know? Right. So I'm very reliable, hmm. you know. I, I would say that that's a, I think a good trait, especially in it's music. A real good trait. Be not flaky. Anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Yes is yes, no is no. Because for me, even for me, like if, if I'm hiring somebody or in a band or or if I'm putting a band together for a certain show, you know, it's just it feels so much better when somebody is prepared and like you know you you get to the rehearsal and they have they have it together so i know how that feels as opposed to, i like to lay that on what i'm doing you know yeah. so i know how that feels so it's 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 just i think a good way to be you know do you happen to know a guy out there andrew sinowick he's a session younger younger 30s maybe a session player he's very no. he's like kind of like taking the mantle from some of the older guys that are so is he a guitar player yeah he's a multi-instrumentalist but he's a guitar player yeah he i might have seen the name facebook or somewhere but i don't i, don't, I can't say i know no he, he made an interesting comment to me he made a record it's actually his second record a great funk record funny enough um in fact it was really weird i said dude how why is the funkiest record i've heard in years come from a middle-aged white dude from maryland you know, <laughs> great record. But anyway, I was talking I and mean, he had, he had session players play on some of the cuts. And I said, what, what did you learn from that? And he goes, honestly, what I learned is how important it is. Like there were some of the guys, you know, it's midnight and they're like, look, man, it's, we're tired. And there's other guys like, oh yeah, man, let's do it again. Oh yeah. Yeah. He goes, and as a session player myself, it was really, it reinforced because he's a C, he made the record, but he's a session player. He said it reinforced how important my attitude I bring into the studio is, which is kind of like what you're talking about. You know? Oh, totally, man. Some of those big guys that I've had on, on recordings, a lot of drummers, some of them, I'm not going to say which ones, but they have that attitude, man. They're, they don't mail it in. They're like, let's get it right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what you want. And they, they, don't, they don't run out of energy. And it's really great to see because they're really successful, some of these guys. And, uh, and they just go like, man, let's do it. You, you cool with it? You want, you want to grab that bridge? Let's, you know? And it's just, it's just a, that's a nice way to be. Oh, it's a great way to be. Yeah. yeah. Best childhood memory? Oh, boy. Childhood. Yeah, which could be anything you want. Well, I was really big into baseball. So, you know, hitting a home run in an all-star game, I That's kind of, for killer. some, it's always a good feeling, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I, I remember going to those games, man, smelling the grass with the uniform on. You know, th those are great memories, you know, but like that's one that sticks out, you know, hitting a, hitting a home run over the fence in an all-star game. That's a great. But, just, but just in general, like I, I think playing baseball and, and, and just, you know, get, going to the field, you know, it's just uh, pretty strong. Any hobbies or interests outside of music, Joey? Oh, man, my life. I really don't do anything non-musical, which is horrible. I like to go wine tasting, you know. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> is that a hobby? Because <laughs> we could drive to like Los Olivos up in like by Santa Barbara and there's great wineries up there and Paso Robles is, you know, Russian Valley and all these places are drivable, you know. Hmm. Napa's a little bit of a far drive, but um, it's just a good hang, you know, like sure, some of those. Man vineyards and just kind of drinking the really good wine you know that's I, that's a hobby 
<laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. What's your favorite place you've traveled? You've probably been a lot of places. Yeah, Italy. Love Italy. Yeah. That comes up a lot. Italy comes up a lot. Italy and Spain actually too comes up a lot. Yeah, I'm 100% Italian and that's like my, my heritage. So just, just being there, it's a special kind of place. And uh, I love the vibe and the pace and stuff like that. It's really cool. The do history. Know, do you know who Neil Giraldo is? Uh, guitar player, right? Pat Benatar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know him. I had him on the show last week and he goes, oh, cool. he goes, Craig, I want to tell you something. Everyone loves, he goes, everyone loves guitar, but everyone loves Italians. <laughs> Cause he's from, that's not too far off. Yeah. He's from Sicily. <laughs> so he was yeah. just hilarious. <laughs> he kept, yeah. Yeah. And it's like everybody in his, it was like, he's telling stories because my uncle Nunzio is like very stereotypical Italian. It was like, you know, the first Makes his own wine in the basement. Yeah. It was like the, well, that, he did. He did because he owns a bourbon company. I said, how'd you get into that? He goes, well, my uncle Nunzio was, used to make his own wine in the basement in, in I think, uh, Cleveland he grew up. It was really funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. Oh, my God. Um, man, t- toughest decision you've ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Oh, man. Well, going back to New York, <laughs> That was a tough one after, you know, loving California and, you know, being with Tommy and Meredith, you know, later on, um, I really was on the fence, you know, I didn't know. I, I was remember asking myself, why am I, why am I going back? You know? And then, um, I don't know. I really don't know. To this day, I don't know why I went back. You know, I probably. Yeah. You went back to meet your wife. Well, she was, she, I met her in California, which is, it's, you know, that was just a separate trip from, I was still living in New York, you know, but um, yeah, just, I don't know. Like I, I, I kind of asked myself this day out of really looking back, don't really, there was no clear cut reason why I went back other than, you know, obviously my mother, you know, my family wanted me to come back, you know, yeah. but um, it was a tough decision. Yeah. I know that's kind of lame because no, people have made really tough decisions in their lives that I mean, you know, yeah, but it was health or, you know, certain things, but. No, but sometimes I think you do something simply because it's better than staying still. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I guess that's that's definitely my my personality is to always try something or do something different, or if there was any sense of a lull, change it. You know. Yeah, yeah. getting out of the where you're at often is a yeah, big, yeah. You know, I'm, I know I'm, I do that. Yeah, I agree. Hey, two more questions. I really appreciate your time, and thanks for being so. Yeah, no problem. Man. Uh, most important lesson that your business has taught you? Um, don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> don't suck. If you, if you suck, t-shirt. yeah, don't suck. Because the, the second you, you, you know, you, you let the, 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 you know, your foot off the gas, man, there's someone else ready to take your thing, whether it's a, guitar gig or production or songwriting or whatever, you know, always, always have value, you know, always have value and, and do it at your, your top level, you know, whatever you think is your top level and bring it, man, always bring it. When I go to Nashville on these writing trips, I, I go 10 deep on an idea. Like when you're in a room, say, what do you want to write about? You know, I'll play something. If they don't like that, how about this? Oh, how about this lyric? How about this title? Just be ready. Be prepared. Don't suck. And 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 then uh, that's the best advice. Yeah, man. Be prepared is so important as a musician. Yep. I've talked to at least a hundred people that have said, I, you know, I was. Oh, I, my thing is I'm over prepared, and that's why I was able to get X Y Z gig from time to time. Yep. Always a good idea to be prepared. And dude, last question. Um, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is just a function of aging? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mellow, you know, I, I think I mellowed out and it's part of it's by design because you know, this, this industry can stress you out. And if you worry about every single thing that are, you know, you, if you pick everything that you can worry about, there's a long list. So, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you re- and it's legit, you know, I could worry about it, so many different things, but 
you know, I think that um, I mellowed out. And I think um, one of the things I did, another, again, by design is I simplified a lot. You know, I simplified what I expect, uh, you know, to make financially. I don't live above my means. I have a car so that's, that's paid off and I love not having car payments. I could very easily go down the road and get a, you know, cheap Grand Cherokee or Kia or whatever, and, you know, and have car payments. Yeah. I could do that, but my car's fine. <laughs> you know, it runs and just simplified. Like, so uh, simplifying, mellow out, and those are by design, you know. Good man. Yeah. Well, dude, let me tell people where to get a hold of you um, and what you got going on. So first of all, talk about uh, your project, Honey River, and people can see that two places. Go to Instagram, Honey River Music, and go to honeyrivermusic.com, and it's also on joeysykes.com, and Sykes is S-Y-K-E-S, -E Italian name. Um, <laughs> fake, fake name alert, fake name alert. Um, Talk about Honey River. Talk about that project. So Honey River started, um, I started it, uh, you know, from going to Nashville so many times, I started like having these songs, really good songs piling up. And they were really in that vein of like uh, country, but rock, you know, country yeah. rock. So I love Tom Petty, love the Eagles, love Jackson Brown. So I said, man, I'm going to put a band together in LA, like a Southern California some throwback to like, what like you know, Eagles. Yeah, I love reading about those stories and, and watching the Eagles documentary. I, I, I feel like, you know, I should have been born like and come up in that time, that Laurel yeah. Canyon, you know, like where they're just, you know, almost hippie mentality, you know. Yeah. So these songs fit perfectly. So I wanted to put a, a my, my idea was three guys who all play instruments and all sing so we could share lead vocals like the Eagles, you know, yeah. the, the Eagles kind of blueprint, you know, a lot of harmonies, songs. And so as a producer of, the, of you know, where I had the studio and, ha and I had the material, I put the thing to together and um, it's, you know, it, <clears throat> it's challenging to get it, getting a band from the ground level to another level. You know, we've been able to open for Timothy B. Schmidt from the Eagles, uh, Fabulous Thunderbirds and um, recorded a bunch of songs have a bunch of videos on YouTube if you want to check out. They're, they're actually really good. You have some good songs on there. Yeah, thank you. Got yeah. Steve Ferroni, Tom Tom Petty's drummer, on three songs on the album, and uh, that was another amazing uh, thing to, to meet him and become friends with him and have him play. And he played with us live, and he played a bunch of songs on his guest uh, show on on Sirius. He has he has a guest oh, DJ cool. show, the new guy show on Tom Petty Radio. So he played some uh, played some four music. songs, yeah, great, four, man. four Honey River songs, and so that's that's been amazing for him to do that, and uh, so yeah, so please follow us and and write and check it out and and spread the word because this is the time and we really need it, you know, we need the support. Absolutely, yeah. it's again, it's Honey River is the band. It's at honeyrivermusic.com and Honey River Music on Instagram. Uh, you can find Joey on Instagram at Joey Sykes. Again, it's S Y K E S nine zero three on Instagram. Also, if you're interested in connecting with Joey in either a writing capacity or as a producer, reach out to him through the contact tab on his website on joeysykes.com. Please be respectful of his time and, you know, be serious if you're going to contact him about this stuff because, I mean, he's pretty serious about what he does. With yeah, this. well, thanks. Yeah, joey at joeysykes.com is pretty easy. Okay. That's a good email to just hit me up in or uh, Instagram, whatever. If you could find me, you know. Awesome. And uh, you also had sent me something about you doing some work with uh from a the guy from angel i forgot his name sorry oh frank domino <laughs> yeah i saw him in a video um there was they made a movie like a documentary did you see this it was um no it's called it's on amazon prime brand or band oh i didn't he, see that it was just kind of interesting he's got little round glasses yeah, yeah he's, and, uh, he's, like a little soul patch yeah, lead singer yeah. of a, a, a 70s, 80s band called Angel. Angel, yeah, he's in there. Yeah. Brand or band. It was kind of interesting, yeah. He still sounds great, man. He's such a great guy. And he's, you know, kind of, you know, getting ready to... Angel just released an album, so he's probably going to do a solo album, another one 
coming up. So um, we, we wrote a bunch of songs together. So that's that cool. Was, yeah, it was great. He came to my house and, and uh, he sings great, man. He's got a killer voice and he's a really great guy. Were they a Long Island band? No, they, they kind of made it. I think in, he's an East Coast guy, but um, I think they made it in L.A. pretty much. I think they were on Casablanca Records. Yes, they Kiss were. Was, yeah. yeah. They talked about that of, in the movie, actually. Yeah, I think Kiss, they were on the same label. and same, I think Same, same story yeah. like with you. Yeah, the Kiss kind of, you know, pretty much controlled Casablanca. Exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not funny. Anyway, man, uh, thank you for everything. And, and then, and then uh, I, I know that uh, you wanted to mention something about the babies. You know? Yes, I apologize. No, it's okay. So when are you guys touring and what's going on with the babies? So the babies, you know, another band from 70s and 80s. Um, I got hooked up with them as, as a writer, really, in like 2013. A couple of original guys from the, old, from the original line of Tony Brock and Wally Stocker. They're, they're, they put 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 a version back together and uh someone connected me to write songs for the album i wasn't even in the live version of it yet and, uh, so that was like two, 2013 or something like that and now we just do shows you know here and there tour some a little bit and the next shows are going to be uh the coach house in california and the canyon club i think september 7th and 8th those right. are the next shows coming up yeah and I think those guys are active on social media and posting. Yeah, the yeah. baby's official. Yeah. B-A-B-Y-S. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. you. That. Cool. Yeah. All right, brother. Anything, any other final words? Anything I forgot? Left no, out? man. That's it. Thank you for the time, for the time and uh, Thank you, man. the spirit. And um, God bless you for being interested in like stories and stuff like this. You know, it's cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate your time. Hang on a minute. Let me wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Support Joey Sykes Music. Again, let me give you some links. It's honeyrivermusic.com. Honey River Music on Instagram. Joey Sykes, S-Y-K-E-S.com. Uh, and you can email Joey, Joey at JoeySykes.com. And on Instagram, Joey Sykes 903 Make sure you go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank love. you, Joe.